Hi everyone and welcome to today's lecture in which we're going to move forward in the semester and start to talk about evolution and evolutionary processes. But everything we discussed so far will keep coming back. So for instance, today we'll still continue, especially near the end, to have a lot of genetics and, and allele references. So please make sure that you stay comfortable in terms of the genetic terminology we've already discussed. Now, the first thing I want to talk about today is the rise of evolutionary thought. And I want to kind of introduce you into this figure here that helps show you the, the way that evolutionary thought itself basically evolved throughout time. Okay, and I want you to know the four main models that we have here that kind of helped explain the diversity of life and that ultimately changed over time toward the end here which still is the the most widely accepted understanding of how evolution actually works so when we talk about the models the first model i want you to know is the model proposed by plato and so plato was a greek philosopher and in his concept of the diversity of life he explained it as all organisms already having been created as these perfect entities by a divine figure so in his case he said all of the organisms that you see on the earth were created by god in a way that they were already perfect as they were meant to be and they are not changing so i really want you to emphasize the fact that plato explained the diversity that you see in terms of organisms as having already been created that the species are not changing okay and that any variety that you see you know that that already exists is basically trivial and unimportant okay and we consider this what's called typological thinking so circle star highlight that term you will see it again typological thinking is where it kind of explain it's a thinking that explains that you know organisms are types and that they're not changing they're already the way that they're meant to be Okay. Then that idea eventually evolved into Aristotle's theory. Now Aristotle continued the typological thinking of, you know, species are not changing, they're already perfect entities. But what Aristotle added to the theory now is what's called a linear scale, okay? he created this idea that organisms are already you know the perfect entities described by plato but they're on a linear scale where you have organisms that are lower beings and then ultimately you have organisms that are higher beings and so in this kind of idea as you can see in that picture they figure you know plant life well that's a lower organism not much you know there but then humans we're the highest uh, of the organisms okay so Aristotle's model introduced the idea of a ladder-like scale of lower to higher organisms. But then as time went on, that typological thinking of seeing organisms as unchanging things eventually started to break down. And then we came to Lamarck. And Lamarck, I want you to remember as being the first one to propose the first formal theory of evolution, okay? It's not the theory that we currently accept, but it was the first time that someone was formally proposing the idea that instead of species being typological, you know, unchanging, just types that are perfect already, Lamarck introduced the idea that organisms do change throughout time. They are not static, unchanging, perfect beings, okay? Lamarck did keep some stuff from the previous models. He kept 
that scale of nature, which simply means when you see the scale of nature, that simply means he still believed that there was a linear organization of, of species with lower beings and higher beings, okay? But now he's introducing the idea that organisms do change. The other aspect of Lamarck that I want you to remember is in his model, he believed that organisms start as these lower beings and then in their own lifetime, they change to make their way into higher beings based on their need to overcome challenges in their environment. And the classic example of this that you've probably all seen in previous classes, even back in high school or middle school, is the model of Lamarck's giraffes. So in Lamarck's theory of evolution, if you are a giraffe and you're out and wild, you want the leaves that are on those high trees. You're hungry. So each day you will gradually stretch your neck up to try and reach those leaves. And throughout your lifetime of constantly stretching, eventually your neck will be long enough to reach the trees. And then when you reproduce, you pass on that trait of a longer neck. Okay, so in his model, the individual was changing throughout its lifetime to better survive the environment it was in. Now, that is not what we currently believe today. Instead, evidence now has piled up to support the Darwin and Wallace model, which you see here at the end. Now, the Darwin and Wallace model, okay, that continues to demonstrate that evolution includes species changing throughout time, okay? But they realize that species are not linear, okay? We're not just this scale of low to higher organisms. And more importantly, Darwin and Wallace realize that individuals are not changing in their lifetime. I want you to circle star highlight that idea. Individuals do not change in their lifetime. Okay, if you are trying to reach the top shelf of your closet every single day and you are stretching your arm out as far as you can, it is not going to eventually get longer. And then you pass down, you know, chimpanzee length or orangutan length arms to your kids. Okay, evolution is not happening to the individual in their lifetime. Instead, what Darwin and Wallace showed is that there's a whole lot of variety around that's already there. You already have, for instance, in the idea of the giraffes that we're going to see later, you already have all different giraffe lengths, you know, longer, longer necks, shorter lengths. You have a lot of variety already for reasons that we're going to discuss later. And then what happens is the varieties that are best suited to survive and reproduce, those are the varieties that will pass their genes to their offspring, including their, you know, the higher fitness levels. And when you are passing those genes to the offspring, well, now in that population, you will end up seeing more of those beneficial traits and fewer of the less beneficial traits as generations go on. Okay, so we're going to see this more throughout this lesson because that's the widely accepted model that has the most evidence now. And so that's what we're going to, you know, really focus on a lot throughout today's lesson. But I want you to be very comfortable with these four main models. Know the people's names, know what their main theory was, and how it differed from each one. So remember I said Aristotle, well now you suddenly have the scale of nature included. Okay, low to high organisms. Lamarck, well now you have species changing. Okay, so what did each one of them do? Since that was a whole lot of information at once, I did write a recap, a brief recap, of course, you know, we, we just went through each of these models. So now I want you to be able to make sure you, you can write the key points. So you can pause, take a picture or write down in your notes all of these key points 
Again, make sure you know the name and the main point of their model. How did it differ from the others? Because I can either ask about a name or I can describe a model and say which, which um, scientist proposed or which philosopher proposed that idea, okay? Now, in those descriptions, the main models of, you know, to explain the diversity of life that you see throughout time, there are two terms that I kept knowing, and I want you to know the difference between these terms, okay? I want you to know what typological thinking is versus evolutionary thinking, okay? Or we can phrase it as typological theory versus the theory of evolution. So again, please remember that in typology, Okay. That's a way of thinking where organisms are unchanging types. They are believed to have been already per perfect entities. Okay, They're perfect just the way they are. That's how they were made, and they are not changing throughout time. Okay, And that any variations you see, it's not significant in that way of thinking. Whereas evolution and evolutionary thought that showed that organisms are changing throughout time and that the variations you see, whether it's the, the long neck, neck giraffe versus short necks, whether it's you know the differences you see in, in people in terms of muscle structure, okay? Um, all of that, that exists through changes throughout time and those variations matter, they affect the survival, they affect the reproductive success, they are important. Okay, so make sure you know typology or typological versus evolution. Now, one of the big take home messages of this lesson that I want to keep reinforcing, and I'm going to repeat some of the visuals and the explanations because I really want to drive home this message to you, is when we talk about evolution, you have to ask yourself what evolves, what does not? And the answer to that is the population evolves, not the individuals. OK, so in order to understand evolution, you kind of have to remember that you're viewing populations as the whole collection of the individuals. And, you know, you have that variety within that population that we're talking about. And please keep in mind, like I said, a single organism or a single individual is never going to be changing you know or evolving within its own lifetime okay so sometimes you'll you'll hear it phrased as a single organism is never typical of an entire population okay so the way that i like to show this again is with that giraffe example that's the classic example it's very visual kind of easy to represent the differences in our models and what we mean by the population evolves, not the individuals. So the visual that I keep mentioning to help explain that idea that it's the population, not the individuals changing, is that the incorrect old idea was that the giraffe, you know, this organism would have a short neck and then it would keep stretching its own neck throughout its lifetime trying to reach more and more leaves and eventually it stretched the neck nice and long and then he passes that trait down to the offspring that it has, okay? Instead, the truth is evolution occurs on the population, not the individual. So all at the same time in a population, you'll have giraffes with different, slightly different length necks, okay? And again, we'll go through the reasons why that is genetically in a few slides later on. But right now, the idea is this population has variety and the giraffe with the variety or the trait that's most beneficial. So in this case, the giraffe with the longest neck to really reach the top leaves and survive better now gets to reproduce. And when that one reproduces, it passes on that trait to its offspring. So you end up after generations now, 
the long neck trait is more prominent because that's the that's the kind of trait that led that organism to be able to reproduce, you know, survive, reproduce, and pass on the genes for that trait to the offspring. Whereas genes are traits that are not as beneficial, well, what's going to happen if you have a gene or a trait that's not very beneficial, you're more likely to die off and more likely to die off before you get to reproduce. And if you do not reproduce, you are not passing down your genes to further generations. So they, those traits will die off in the population. And this is one more visual just to kind of really drive home the message. So this is showing the old model was short neck individual, stretch, stretch, stretch until that one individual now has the longer neck and passes that on. Whereas the accepted or evidence-based model is the Darwin-Wallace model where you start off with variety, okay? And the one that's able to be most fit for that environment. For instance, the longer neck to reach the most leaves to, to really get to eat and survive then passes on the trait because that's the one that got to reproduce. The other ones, if you're too short to reach those leaves, you're not eating enough, you're not going to be healthy enough to survive. If you do survive, you're not going to be healthy enough to really uh, end up catching that mate and, and really passing on your genes. So generations later, we'll have more of the beneficial genes. So again, it's not the individual evolving, it's the population. Now, I keep mentioning the term evidence, you know, evidence for one model over another. And when I say evidence in terms of evidence for evolution or change through, through time, there are two big discoveries that really helped provide evidence for what's going on in terms of evolution. Because think about it, if it's not happening in someone's lifetime, well, how do we know it's happening? How do we study it? Well, thankfully, scientists discovered two things that really helped with providing evidence for evolution. It was the fossil record and sedimentary rocks. Now, when we talk about fossils, a fossil, other than being, you know, what we call someone who's really old, uh, don't call me that just because I'm your professor, um, a fossil is any trace of an organism that lived in the past. And now sometimes those traces are very obvious, like, you know, the giant dinosaur bones that you see at the museum. But sometimes it's something as simple as tracks left by, you know, hoof prints, paw prints, footprints, um, even, you know, dung, meaning ancient poop, uh, any of that any remnant that helps you get a visual that an organism was there at that location and some idea of what it may have looked like, that's a fossil, okay? And the fossil record is basically all the fossils that have been found on Earth and mapped out through scientific literature. And what helps with making that fossil record is when you combine the knowledge you get from those fossils with what's called sedimentary rocks, which are these rock layers that you end up seeing. The deeper the rock layer is, the older that area of earth, that layer of earth is. Because sedimentary rocks basically form as sand, mud, and all of these various um, minerals deposit in layers, and usually it happens, you know, beaches, river mouths, all, all kinds of locations, but you get these layers that scientists are actually able to then kind of estimate the rate that they were formed, which is extremely slow rate, and estimate how old that layer is in terms of the Earth's timeline. And that allowed them to create a geological time scale. So let's say you find, you know, a fossil over here. Well, you know that that organism was around way, way back further in time than a fossil you might find up here or closer to the surface. And you're able to estimate exactly what point in the Earth's 
history that organism was from. So by combining the fossil record and sedimentary rocks, they've been able to make this very valuable geological time scale to really see what organisms existed when, where they were, and how they might have changed throughout time. Okay. Now, what's really interesting with the fossil record and that geological time scale is that it allowed us to discover extinct species. And unfortunately, a lot of species are extinct. Okay, extinct species, what that means is species that no longer exist. And this provided very important information in the evolutionary theory because Darwin was then able to interpret the idea that any organisms who no longer exist that have gone extinct, that's evidence that species are not static, that populations are constantly changing, okay? And it basically goes by reason that if species have gone extinct, then the array or the populations of species living on Earth has changed through time. Okay, so extinct species help you see the idea that change is occurring. And unfortunately, the, when, the idea of extinct species, it's really sad that the majority of organisms that have lived on Earth are actually extinct now. So what you see in your everyday life is only a minimal, like 1%, you know, amount of the organisms that have lived on Earth throughout time. The bulk of them, like 99% of them, have already gone extinct. Now, when we talk about evolution and all of those changes that occur in species and these various organisms, there's some more terminology I want you to be familiar with. One of the terms I want you to know is the idea of transitional features, okay? And this kind of came about as the fossil record expanded. You know, researchers were able to see more and more of what features species had. And they discovered transitional features, which is defined as a trait in a fossil species that is intermediate between the really old ancestors versus the more modern younger species okay so transitional features are a feature or trait in a fossil species that is intermediate between the ancestors and what you see now okay and a classic example of this which you see in the figure here is the study in terms of fossils documenting the gradual transition or change over time from aquatic animals that had fins to the terrestrial animals that had limbs okay and so here you see all the ancient ancestors and what their structures looked like and then how it compares to the modern limbs and the idea of you know, fins heading toward the structure you see now in, in things like people, in your own hands, in your own feet, okay? So remember transitional features and this example of transition from fins to the limbs we, we see today. Another term that I want you to be familiar with, you know, this term most people have heard of already, is the idea of vestigial traits. And a vestigial trait is simply a reduced or incompletely developed structure that now has either no function or a reduced function, but is very similar to fully functional structures in ancestors or even closely related species. And the classic example is our tailbone, okay, the human coccyx, 
And that little tailbone, as you can see, it's a very reduced structure compared to the nice long tail structure of some other organisms like the spider monkey here. Okay, so the spider monkey's tail is not vestigial. An example of a vestigial trait is our tailbone or coccyx. So please circle star highlight the classic example as our own little tailbone. And that's not the only example. That's, you know, the classic example we use. But biologists have documented thousands and thousands of examples of vestigial traits, meaning, you know, reduced or no longer functional structures and you know some of these are for instance whales and snakes they have tiny hip and leg bones um, that that don't help them when they're swimming or slithering you know but they're remnants of structures that existed in ancestors or even when you look at ostriches right they have these reduced little wings and those wings can't let them fly right they're reduced structures that no longer serve the purpose that they did in their ancestors or that you see used in, in you know, common uh, relative organisms. Okay, so make sure you know what transitional features are and what vestigial traits are. Now, as I say that word, you know, ancestor and mentioned ancestors in, in the previous slides in my explanations, um, I want you to kind of keep in mind in evolution the idea of descent from a common ancestor and the kinds of evidence that help, you know, support that idea. The, the idea with common ancestors, the big piece of evidence is homologies, okay? So sometimes you hear me or see me write it as homologies, which is plural, versus homology, which is singular. Either way, what that means is a homology is a similarity that exists in species due to a common ancestor or common ancestry. So an example of this is our human hair and the fur that you see on your dogs or on your cats or your pets, okay? Because humans and those organisms share a common ancestor, a very early mammal species that had hair. So our hair and their fur are considered homologies, okay? Similarities in structures or similarities existing in species due to a common ancestor. And there are three levels at which we study these homologies, these similarities, okay? The first one is genetic homology, okay? So genetic homology, which you see up here, are similarities in the gene sequences and ultimately the, the amino acids or the protein sequences, okay, that came from or were inherited from a common ancestor. So genetic homologies are similarities in DNA, RNA, or amino acid sequences that were inherited from a common ancestor. If instead of talking about DNA similarities, if in let's say an exam question, I talk about the pharyngeal pouch or a little limb bud or even a tail structure, okay, tail in an embryo, that would be developmental, okay? Developmental homologies are similarities in embryonic forms of development. So the moment I mention an embryo, that tells you it's developmental. If I were just talking about tail length, for instance, or tail bones in fully, you know, adult organisms, that would be structural homology. But the moment I mention embryonic or embryo structures, that means that we're talking about developmental similarities. So make sure you know that difference because like I said, on an exam, I can describe something either saying, you know, an RNA sequence similarity showing common ancestry or an embryonic tail between organisms showing 
common ancestry. And you would have to tell me what kind of homology I'm talking about. Is it genetic, developmental, or structural? And the last one, structural, is demonstrated here. Like I just said, structural homology would be similarities in adult organism structures that demonstrates inheritance from a common ancestor. So here you have the similarities in bone structures between or amongst all of these different organisms that show common ancestry with regard to these, these limb bones and, and limb structures. Okay, so make sure you're comfortable with knowing what homology means and what we mean by each of the three ways to study it, genetic, developmental, and structural. Now, you may not have realized it, but we've already kind of really set down the, the idea of natural selection throughout this lesson. You're, you're all pros at really knowing what it means, even if we didn't really keep describing it as natural selection and Darwin's postulates, but it's kind of what we've been going through in a lot of these slides so far. So the purpose of this slide is to really, you know, put the the aspects of natural selection and Darwin's theory into one place, his four postulates in terms of evolution and natural selection. And they're very straightforward in terms of kind of common sense if you think about it with with what you kind of see around you in, in evolution and ecology and all of that. So Darwin's four postulates is like I mentioned earlier, variation already exists among organisms in a population. So that was the idea when I said that you'll have a population and for instance, the giraffes will already have long, medium, short length uh, necks. His classic example is the, the beak structure of different finches. Okay, different birds, some of them are long, pointy, curved, some are thicker, some are thinner. And so this variety already exists among organisms in a population. Okay, some of these trait differences are heritable, meaning that these organisms have alleles and genes coding for those structures, whether it's a longer, shorter beak, whether it's a thicker or thinner, more precise beak, those can be passed down to their offspring because they are in the genes, they're coded for by genetics. These traits with variability, okay, some of them will increase the chance of survival and reproductive success, whereas others may make it harder for that organism to survive or reproduce and make it more likely to die off before reproduction in that population because survival and reproductive success is highly variable. And the last point here, the last postulate is the real take home message of natural selection. Okay? The idea that some of these individuals will survive better than others because of the variation that they have in their trait. Okay, so for instance, look at this guy here, this, this beak here, okay? If there are very narrow flowers where they're living and his beak allows him to better get nectar, better survive, get nutrition, nourishment, and survive, well now he has lived longer, gets to reproduce, and that gets passed on. And it is not random which traits get passed on. Instead, it's the ones that help you survive and reproduce because ultimately the only time a trait is going to get passed on is if you can reproduce. Okay, so these are the four postulates from Darwin. Now to really understand those postulates and the idea of natural selection, it's really important for you to understand what we mean by the three terms that I have on this slide. 
The first one is fitness, and we're not talking about gym bros and you know how strong, how big your muscles are. With fitness, we're talking about the ability of an organism or a specific individual to produce surviving viable offspring, okay, relative to the ability of all the other off, uh, organisms to reproduce and, and produce offspring. Okay, so fitness is being able to produce surviving offspring to get the chance to reproduce compared to other organisms around you. And the next term, adaptation, that's the heritable trait that will increase your chances of fitness. Okay, the heritable traits that will make it more likely that you will survive and reproduce and pass on your genes to your offspring. The last term is selection. And selection, you know, in everyday life, selection we think of as an active process. You're picking, you know, and choosing things. But in, in this case, selection is not, you know, a purposeful choice. Selection is the idea that differential reproduction happens as a result of heritable variation, which is a fancy scientific way of saying the best qualities, the qualities or adaptations that make it you most fit, most likely to reproduce, that's what ends up passed on to the offspring. So those genes, those alleles, those traits are selected for because they're the ones that get passed on to the next generation and those are the traits that end up carrying on throughout generations. Okay, those are the traits that were selected for and survive throughout time. Now, the information on this slide is again something that we've been you know, emphasizing so far throughout this whole lesson, but I wanted you to have it in writing the reality versus common misconceptions, you know, so three common misconceptions about evolution will be the opposite of what you see written on this slide. I purposely did not write the misconceptions because I did not want anyone, you know, seeing them, getting them, you know, ingrained in their mind and believing them as truth. Instead, I want you to emphasize the reality. So one common misconception that we've mentioned already over and over today is the idea that some people, you know, think evolution is happening on the individual. The reality is that evolution does not change an individual. You don't see the changes in your own lifetime. Only the population is changed through evolution. The second misconception is a lot of people think well, I'll actually put it as second and third. So the second and third common misconceptions is that a lot of people think that evolutionary changes happen in a goal-directed manner and lead to perfection. And that's the misconception that you see in Lamarck's theory of, you know, a giraffe having the goal of reaching the taller leaves and, you know, stretching their neck until they are the perfect size to reach those leaves, and that is false, okay? That's a misconception. Instead, evolution is not goal direction, and it does not lead to perfection. Instead, mutations throughout time have occurred by chance, you know, not because organisms want or need them to survive. You know, there's no such thing as the higher or lower organism. Instead, these mutations occurred by chance. You have all of this variety. And then from there, you know, the better suited, the better fit will have a better chance of reproduction and passing things on. OK, it's not that things are changing toward a specific goal. Now, I keep saying that there's all this variety and all this variation in a population, but where did that come from? What is the source behind evolution? And the answer is your alleles. And again, alleles are alternate forms of genes. That's variety in genetic sequences. And that's important because that's what codes for all of your features.
It's the alleles, the genes that code for whether the giraffe has a long or short neck or whether you have longer or shorter arms, okay? So keep in mind, alleles are behind evolution. Now we keep mentioning natural selection as you know the main thing about evolution, but natural selection is not the only process responsible for evolution. And I want to point out that earlier I said, you know, there's variation in all of these organisms and I'll explain later why that variation exists. So this is me explaining later why that variation in organisms exists. Like we said, it's differences in alleles, okay? So what exactly, what four processes drive those changes or differences in allele frequencies and thus in the traits that you see? The answer is natural selection that we've been talking about, as well as genetic drift, gene flow, and mutation. And right now we're gonna go through each of these to see what they mean, you know, how exactly are they changing allele frequencies? The first one is natural selection, which you're all experts at now. The idea of natural selection saying, you know, some organisms are through their variety are going to be more fit for a certain circumstance, whereas others are less fit. So in the case of this figure here, you see natural selection affecting a allele frequencies because in this population being a green beetle having the allele to make you green in life is actually a bad thing for your fitness because these birds prefer to eat green beetles so with each generation the birds are going to be eating more and more of the green beetles that's removing them from the population and not giving them a chance to reproduce. Whereas what happens to the orange beetles? Well, that orange allele is very beneficial here. It makes you more fit because you do not get eaten, okay? Instead, you get to survive and reproduce. So with each generation, the allele frequency changes in that there will be more and more orange beetles because those are the ones surviving and reproducing. Okay. So natural selection of affects allele frequencies in that the alleles contribute to reproductive success and the ones that are better suited to surviving and reproducing, those are the ones that get passed on because you have gotten to reproduce and that's how genes get passed on. Okay, So you end up getting an increase in frequency of certain alleles that are deemed, you know, more beneficial. The next thing that can change allele frequencies in a population is genetic drift. And in this case, you have allele frequencies changing randomly. Okay, and in some cases that may even change alleles that actually decrease fitness and it might change the frequency to increase them, to make them more common in a population. Because what you see here with genetic drift, you're getting a change in allele frequencies randomly, especially in small populations. Meaning, for instance, here you have a population of beetles, okay? Let's say that being a, a, an orangish or beige beetle is less beneficial, okay? Let's say in this case, they're the ones that would get eaten off normally, okay? So normally you'd have green alleles increasing in the population and beige alleles decreasing. In genetic drift, boom, what happens? A random by luck event occurs, knocks out or kills a whole bunch of those organisms, in this case, the green beetles, what do you notice? The population genetics are now different. You've now seen a dramatic decrease in green beetles, not because they were more fit to survive, they had any you know, benefit by being green. No, it was randomly a whole bunch of them got wiped out, okay? So it didn't matter whether they were better fit to survive, less fit to survive, it just happened that that location something knocked them, knocked them out or wiped them out. 
Okay, so whenever you hear luck or random change and small population, think genetic drift. Okay, and one of the ways we, we kind of say that officially is you end up with the chance disappearance, okay, by luck, the chance disappearance of particular genes as individuals die or do not reproduce. Okay, so you saw that by the smushed beetles. The next possible event is gene flow. Okay, so first we had natural selection, which is, you know, more fit, beneficial, you're going to increase that allele frequency. Next, we had genetic drift, where all of a sudden you're losing a bunch of, you know, um, members of the population through a sudden death or, or decrease randomly. Gene flow now is when individuals leave one population and move to another and now breed in that new population. Okay, so you don't have death and loss of alleles through random changes. Instead, in gene flow, you have the flow of individuals from one population to another and now breeding there. So you get the introduction of new alleles into a population. So in this case, at first, you may have had only green beetles in this location, but then whoop, a beige beetle, a brown beetle migrated. So when you hear migration, immigration, any of those terms, that's gene flow. It migrated into that population and now it's going to reproduce there. And you're going to have new traits, new colors, new alleles, because it moved from one population to another. And at the same time, not only is this population evolving to have new alleles, but the population where that individual departed from, that population's also evolving and changing because it may have lost alleles and traits by those organisms leaving that population. Okay, so gene flow is movement of individuals, so you get the introduction of new alleles in one population and may have lost alleles or traits in the other. The last one is my personal favorite because I love genetics and anything to do with DNA. And so this last one is mutation, showing that you constantly have mutations occurring in, in, in populations. So mutations will continually create new alleles because they are changing the sequences of the DNA. Because remember, the flat out definition of a mutation is a change in the sequence of DNA. And when you change sequences in DNA, sometimes you don't see any difference, but sometimes you do. So for instance, in this scenario, if the green beetles suddenly have a change in their DNA sequence that leads to a brown color or beige color, that's now been the creation of new alleles through mutation, okay? So on an exam, I should be able to describe an event and you should be able to tell me what that is an example of, okay? So if I say, a, a um, purple, purple bug just moved from one population to another, now mated with the new population. What's that an example of, you know, introducing those purple alleles to that population, okay? If I say a change in DNA occurred, change the color, Okay, now that's reproducing in that population. What's that an example of? Okay, so if you have any trouble understanding these four events or distinguishing between them, please do not hesitate to ask me in the Remind app and I'll further explain or give you some more examples and practice. Now the last concept that I want to go over with you today is the Hardy-Weinberg principle. And I want you to circle, star, highlight, pay attention to how we work with this principle throughout the next few slides and the rest of this lecture because this is something, these calculations,
come back in multiple other classes. For instance, if you take genetics later on, if you take evolution later on, you're going to keep seeing these come back. Even ecology, sometimes the professor goes over it again. So please make sure to pay close attention to uh, this part of the lesson and, of course, every part. Um, when we talk about Hardy-Weinberg principle, well, how does that come into play? What does that even mean? Hardy-Weinberg principle is basically this principle where they stated that allele frequencies in a population are constant unless a factor causes them to change. And those factors are things that we just talked about, things like genetic drift, mutation, all that other fun stuff. But what's important about the Hardy-Weinberg principle, it becomes useful because it allows us to analyze the allele frequencies that we've been talking about throughout this whole lesson. So you can use the Hardy-Weinberg principle and the equations and calculations to determine allele frequencies or genotype frequencies of a population and then tell if that population is in equilibrium, meaning is it static, not changing, or is it evolving and changing? And then if it's changing or not, the Hardy-Weinberg principles that we're going to talk about allows us to make some assumptions about what exactly is going on, what changes may have occurred. So when you hear Hardy-Weinberg principle, think of it as equations and calculations that will allow us to analyze allele frequencies or genotype frequencies of a population and determine whether or not that population is in equilibrium meaning static, not changing, or is it changing? Okay, so now when you use Hardy-Weinberg in order to study population genetics and in order to explore that relationship between allele frequencies and genotype frequencies, now before we get into the two predictions that help us do this, I want to point out Remind yourself that allele means the variations of a gene. So for instance, a capital A would be one type of allele, a dominant allele, whereas a lowercase a would be a recessive form of an allele. Whereas genotype frequencies, when we talk about genotypes, we talk about two capital letters representing a homozygous dominant genotype the heterozygous hybrid, which is a capital and a lowercase allele, and the homozygous recessive, okay? So there are two alleles and there are three genotypes we're gonna focus on. Now, when we do these Hardy-Weinberg calculations and population uh, genetic studies, Hardy-Weinberg makes two predictions. The first one is that the frequencies of the alleles in a gene pool do not change over time. So basically what that means, there should be no disturbing effects like mutation or selection or migration or anything that would change the frequency of dominant versus recessive alleles. Okay, so our first prediction is frequencies of the alleles in a gene pool do not change over time. And remember, this is referring to, Hardy Weinberg is referring to an ideal population, a population at equilibrium. So it makes sense that you don't want to see frequencies fluctuating in something that's supposed to be stable or at equilibrium. <clears throat> the second prediction is that if two alleles are at a locus, okay, so for instance, each locus we already know has two alleles because one came from mom, one came from dad, then after a generation of random mating, the frequencies of your genotypes, meaning homozygous dominant, heterozygous, and homozygous recessive in a population can be calculated 
by the Hardy-Weinberg equation. Okay, so first I'm going to write down what I just said, and then we'll take a look at the actual equation. So if two alleles are at a locus, okay, and the alleles can either be dominant or recessive, then after a generation of random mating, okay, it's got to be random mating, then the frequencies of the genotypes, again, there should be three genotypes. There's homozygous dominant, there's our heterozygous, and then there's homozygous recessive. So you can calculate them. with the Hardy-Weinberg equation, okay? And the equation is P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared should equal to 1. And there are a few things that you have to understand when you look at this equation, okay? The first thing you have to realize is that when you see the letter P in this equation, okay, that letter P is representing the frequency of allele dominant, okay? So in this case, we can say P is the frequency of allele capital A, okay? Then when you see the letter Q here and here, Q is the frequency of the lowercase, the recessive allele, okay? Now, let me just erase the screen so that you can really focus in on this concept. Okay, if you have this equation, P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals 1, right? And we just said that P equals frequency of allele A, and Q equals frequency of the recessive allele, right? Well, then P plus Q must equal to 1. Because think about it, in math, 1, remember when we talked about uh, probability and p-values, 1 is the same as saying 100%. And as you know, when you're looking at a, a genotype or the different alleles for a genotype, you only have two possible alleles per trait. Okay, You have that dominant allele, you have the recessive allele. So both of those, the, the frequency of having dominant and recessive, that dominant plus recessive has to equal to one because there's no other allele option here, okay? And when you look at this crazy, scary looking equation, P squared plus two PQ plus Q squared equals one, well, here, let me change the color so that you can really think about what this means. Think of a Punnett square. Right? If we're saying P squared, right, and we said P is the frequency of capital A or your dominant allele, what does P squared then mean? P squared means capital A times capital A, right? Which you know from your Punnett square, when we have two heterozygotes crossed, you have that one doubly dominant genotype possible. 
then 2PQ, where if we said P is capital A and Q is lowercase a, then what we're saying here is 2, capital A, lowercase a, right? Well, where have you seen 2, capital A, lowercase a? Well, let's go back to our Punnett square. Capital A, lowercase a, capital A, lowercase a. Look, 2 of the heterozygous genotype, right? And then what's left? There's one more left, Q squared. That's the third genotype. That's the, the recessive, fully recessive one. And what do you know from our little Punnett square? You have one square that's double lowercase a. Do you see any other squares other than dominant? homozygous, homozygous recessive, and the hybrids? No. So all of those have to add up to one, right? 100% of the possible genotypes in the cross, okay? So that's why you see p squared plus 2pq plus q squared equals one. p squared is homozygous dominant homozygous dominant, sorry, that was very sloppy handwriting. Then we have our second one is the hybrid genotype. And our third one is the homozygous recessive. Okay? So don't get confused when you see these letters and, and different values. Just keep in mind that ultimately all of your genotypes possible for that, that cross should result in one because that they're representing 100% of the possible genotypes. And P plus Q should equal to one because there are only two possible alleles. Okay? So in your notes, make sure you circle star highlight this equation, the P squared plus two PQ plus Q squared equals one, and this one here, P plus Q equals one, because these two will guide all of the work that you're gonna do for Hardy Weinberg, okay? And this slide that we just did, the purpose of it was for you to have background information and understand you know, why does P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals 1? What do these random letters actually mean? Okay? Now you'll also hear it said that when the two alleles do result in the predicted genotype frequencies, the population is said to be in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Okay? And we're going to go through in the upcoming slides what that actually means, you know, when your population is an equilibrium and why it's an equilibrium. And if the numbers, the, the genotypes and alleles are, are out of whack, then what, what does that tell you about the population? Okay, so we're gonna go through some examples to see how exactly we use Hardy-Weinberg and what it all means. Okay, so the first thing that we're gonna do is use Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium and, and equation laws in order to calculate genotype frequencies in a population. So the example that I could give you is I'll tell you that a population is in equilibrium. And we usually write it as if the population is in equilibrium. Okay, and I'll give you frequencies of both alleles, or I could even give you the frequency of just one of the alleles, and automatically you should be able to know the frequency of the other. So for instance, I could say if an equilibrium and the frequency of the dominant allele, capital A, is equal to 0 0.7. Okay, what's the first thing you can figure out once I've given you that information? Well, right away, you can figure out 
the frequency of lowercase a, right? Because if capital, the dominant, is 0.7, what does the lowercase have to be? 0 0.3, right? Because the frequency of the dominant plus the frequency of the recessive have to equal 1. So if I give you the frequency of one allele, you can automatically figure out the other by simply doing one minus the frequency of the first allele. Okay, and that gave me 0 0.3. Then, with that information, I could figure out the frequency of each of the genotypes, right? So we start with homozygous recessive. And, you know, ask yourself what, you know, what these, these letters actually mean. Well, the probability that you get from dad, sorry, from mom, <laughs> a capital A is 0 0.7, right? Let's say the first allele. Then you have a second allele because you got one allele from each parent. So if parent number one gave you the capital A with a frequency of 0.7, well then, what's the probability of your second allele that's capital? Well, that's also 0.7, right? Because we said for this equation, the frequency of capital A is always 0.7. So the probability that that second allele has a capital A is 0 0.7 and was acting up okay 0 0.7 okay so that tells you that the probability of a zygote having that genotype capital A capital A in that population would be so probability capital A capital A well that would be 0 0.7 times 0 0.7, which is equal to 0 0.49, or you can say 49%. So that's basically, this, this calculation we just did basically tells you 49, acting up, 49% of the time, Genotype, capital A, capital A, or homozygous dominant, will occur in this population, okay? Now, we could have done that simply using the p squared plus 2pq plus q squared equals 1. Okay, so you know AA is the same as saying p squared, so 0 0.7 squared is equal to 0 0.49. Okay, so you didn't have to write all of this out that I just did, but it's I wanted you to know the background behind this. Then you have capital A, lowercase a. So you look at the probability, the probability of getting capital A from the male parent, from dad, okay, with lowercase a from the female parent, well, that probability is 0 0.7 for capital A, right, times 0 0.3 for lowercase a. And I'll erase those just so that you don't think I'm dividing by anything in your notes, but that was to show you what the 0 0.7 and 0 0.3 uh, were for, okay? Now, is that the only way that you can get a heterozygote? No, you can also get a heterozygote by getting the dominant allele from mom, okay? So there's a chance of getting dominant allele from mom and getting recessive from dad. So that's also point, sorry, that is point three at times point seven, or in this case, sorry, point seven times point three again.
And that's why in the equation that we saw earlier, it's the same as saying 2PQ, two times the allele, dominant allele times the recessive allele, okay? So two times the dominant, which is 0.7, times the recessive, which is 0.3, okay? So when you do that, two times 0 0.7 times 0 0.3, that gives you 0 0.42 or 42%. 42% chance of getting capital A, lowercase a, the heterozygote in this population. Then the last thing to do is to get the frequency of the homozygous recessive. And that one would simply be, what's our frequency of lowercase a? 0 0.3 times 0 0.3, okay, 0 0.3 times 0 0.3. Again, you can think of it as Q squared. 0.3 squared is the same thing as saying 0 0.3 times 0 0.3, and that gives you 0 0.9 or 9 percent, okay, probability of getting the homozygous recessive in this population. Okay, so make sure you can you can put a, a square around each of the percentages. So 42% chance for the genotype that's heterozygous. And the last one to put a square around is over here, and that is the fully dominant. Okay, we'll put a little star next to each of those values because those are your final answers. Okay, so notice. In the beginning, all I gave you was the frequency of a single allele, the dominant allele. <clears throat> and I could have given you either one. I could have given you the recessive allele instead. Doesn't matter. When you are given a single allele for a population that's in equilibrium, you can then calculate so much. You can calculate the second allele's frequency in that population. You can calculate the homozygous dominant genotype frequency in that population, the heterozygous frequency in that population, and the homozygous recessive frequency in that population. So from one little number, 0.7 frequency of capital A, you got everything else that is written on this slide. If you have any questions on how to use this to go from an allele uh, frequency to calculate genotype frequencies, just send me a message and remind and I'll give you some more examples and I'll go over this slide again. So now what if instead of being given the allele frequency, what if you're given the genotype frequencies for a particular population? Okay, so in this example, uh, I'm going to show you two different ways to tackle a problem in which you're given the genotypes and need to figure out the allele frequencies. So in this example, we're going to have a population of 100 individuals. Now, keep in mind, because we're talking about uh, genotypes and alleles, if you have 100 individuals, each of those people have two alleles for the particular trait that we're looking at because you get one allele from mom and one allele from dad. So keep in mind, 100 individuals means 200, 200 alleles. Okay. So I'm going to write out the frequencies of the three different genotypes. So we have 79 out of 100 people in this population have the genotype 1-1. One, one. Okay, and this is actually a real genotype I'm going to use for this example. So out of 20 out of 100 have the genotype called 1-1 comma delta 32 and only one out of 100 
has the genotype delta 32, delta 32. Now this is a very important genotype in the world, okay, because this genotype, delta 32, delta 32, meaning you have two of the, we'll call it the recessive allele since before we were looking at capital A and lowercase a. So two of the lowercase allele, uh, delta 32, delta 32, people with this are resistant to HIV because it basically causes a mutation in the receptor of your cells that HIV usually binds to and recognizes and uses as like an entry, a door of entry into your cells. These people with Delta 32, Delta 32 genotype, they have a mutated form of that receptor. And so HIV cannot properly recognize and bind and infect those people's cells. If you're heterozygous for it, you won't be fully resistant to HIV, but HIV in these people may progress slower. And then you have the first one. Unfortunately, most of the world population is 1-1. One, one. So one, when we're looking at this problem, allele capital A is 1, and allele lowercase a is delta 32. So those are the names of the alleles. And if you're 1-1 one, one genotype, unfortunately, you can get HIV. You are susceptible to HIV and most of the world population, unfortunately, is genotype 1-1. Now, the first way to tackle this problem, you've been given three genotype frequencies, okay? 79 out of 100, 20 out of 100, and one out of 100. Now, if you want to know the allele frequencies, the first way that you can do this, option number one, I'll write it so you remember in your notes. Option number one to calculate allele frequencies of this population. Okay, what you can do, I'll change the color, is simply count the alleles. Okay, so what that means is we have two alleles. We want to know their frequency. Well, our first allele is allele that's named number one. We can count everywhere that we find it in our genotypes. So where do you find allele one? Here, here, and here. You find it three places. That first one that I circled, what's the frequency of that? 79 out of 100. So you my pen is acting up. 79 for that first one. For the second place that we found it, what's that frequency? That's also 79. And then what's the third frequency? 20. Okay, that gives us 178 alleles, or number one, out of the 200 possible alleles. So 178 out of 200, that's the same as saying 178 over 200, which is equal to 0.89 or 89%. Okay, so that would give you, trying to see where to write it so we don't lose it, uh, 0.89 or 89% of this population is the number one allele. Then I'll change color so that he doesn't get lost in the mix. The second allele that we have is delta 32. That's our second allele. Where do you see delta 32? That first spot is 20. 20 individuals, okay? So there's 20 delta allele, uh, delta 32 alleles there. Where's the next spot that you see delta 32? Right here. 
and that's one, one allele. And the last spot that you see it here, well, that's one allele again. So that's 22 out of 200 alleles, okay? And that's 0 0.11 or 11% of the population, which makes sense because before we said the first allele was 89% of the population, which means the second allele has to be 11% frequency in that population because the two alleles have to. Their frequency, if it's in equilibrium, has to equal to 100%. There's no other allele for that trait in that population. Okay? If you're unsure of how to get allele frequencies by counting the alleles, simply message me in my mind and I'll go over it again. The second way that you can get Sorry, I'm just getting my pen ready. The second way that you can get allele frequencies is you can go by genotype frequencies. Now we said there are three genotypes in this example. There's the one one, the one delta 32, and the delta 32, sorry, the, let me erase that. The delta 32, delta 32 genotype. The first genotype, 1, 1, we said that the frequency was 79 out of 100 individuals. Well, mathematically, what frequency is that? 79 out of 100 means 79 divided by 100. Right, 79 divided by 100, which is equal to 0 0.79 frequency. The second genotype we said was 20 people out of 100 had that one. So you do 20 divided by 100, which gives you 0 0.20 frequency. And the third one we said one out of 100. So you would do one divided by 100, which is 0 0.01 frequency, okay? So now that you wrote out your genotype frequencies, okay, that's what you were just writing out, genotype frequencies. There are your three genotype frequencies. Now you want to figure out the frequencies of your alleles, right? So based on that, the frequency of one, allele one, is, where do you find allele one? Right here in the first genotype, 0.79 frequency. It is that allele one represents that whole genotype, right? It's one one, which means there's no other allele there. So that entire 0.79 represents allele number one. Then where's the next genotype that you see allele number one? The second genotype. But what do you notice about it? Allele number half, only half of that, okay? Sorry, my pen is acting up. So it's only half of that. So you now say plus one half of the frequency of the heterozygote, which is 0 0.2, okay? That gives you 0 0.89 or 89%, which we already knew from our previous calculation, 89% is the frequency of allele one. Okay, and for your notes, in case you forget where we got the numbers, 0.79 is the frequency of homozygous dominant. And then 0.2 is the frequency of heterozygous. Okay. And then the last thing to calculate is the frequency of our second allele, which is delta 32. Where do you see delta 32? 
Well, the first place we see it is the other half of the heterozygote genotype. So one half of that 0 0.2, the heterozygous, plus the entire, the entire homozygous recessive, which is 0 0.01. Okay, and what does that give you? Well, half of 0.2 plus 0 0.01 gives you 0 0.11 or 11%, which we already said was the frequency of delta 32. Okay, so 11% is the frequency of delta 32 in this population. And for in your notes, in case you forget what it means, 89% is the frequency of allele 1 in this population. Okay? If you have any questions or concerns, you're not sure how to do this, just let me know in the Remind app. You're going to get to practice some in the post lab. So hopefully it'll become a little clearer, clearer when you're doing this out on your own. But what I recommend is for each of these slides that I give you an example, once you have watched the video and taken your notes down on each slide, go back to these examples, go to the original question I asked before I started drawing all of the answer out, and see if you can calculate it. You know, from these same numbers, if someone gave you the genotype frequencies of 79, 20, and 1, would you be able to calculate the allele frequencies? Okay? Let me know if you have any questions or concerns. Now, the last thing for us to do is to really use this Hardy-Weinberg as robustly as we can now that you are experts at calculating the genotype frequencies of, an, of a population, the allele frequencies of that population, well, now we're going to use all that information and Hardy-Weinberg to test for equilibrium, to test whether or not a population is actually in equilibrium. And I'm going to show you how to do this in three steps. Okay, so the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to write exactly what the example is. So our example, our example, I'll give you a population. This population includes 283 individuals. Okay, and I'm going to abbreviate individuals, of which... You have 223 have genotype 11. Actually, I'm going to go back to the capital and lowercase because I think students get a little confused with 1 and delta 32 sometimes. So have genotype capital A, capital A. 57 have genotype capital A lowercase, so they're heterozygous, and three have genotype lowercase a, lowercase a. Okay, so remember you need to have three genotypes. You have your homozygous dominant, your heterozygous, and your homozygous recessive. Now, the first thing you're going to want to do when trying to figure out if this population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, the first thing you want to do is ask yourself, what are the frequencies of these genotypes? And all that means is you need to translate numbers and, and language into math, right? So the genotype of our frequencies means we need the frequency of capital A, capital A, the frequency 
of capital A, lowercase a, and the frequency of lowercase, lowercase a. Well, what do you know about capital, capital of the, the homozygous dominant? We said 223 out of 283 have that genotype. And what did we say before about out of in math? 223 out of 283. Whenever you hear out of, you do division. Okay, so all you do is 223 divided by the total. That gives you the frequency. Okay, that's equal to 0 0.788. You can write in your notes that, again, you are dividing that genotype by the total number of organisms. Okay, and I'll actually, I'll put it over here because sometimes if I don't write it, students don't write it. So to get the frequencies of each genotype, you do number with that genotype divided by total individuals. Okay, so then our second one, I'll change the color so you can see this, are heterozygotes. What's the frequency of heterozygotes? Well, 57 out of 283 individuals have the heterozygous genotype. So you do 57 divided by 283, which is equal to 0 0.201. And then we get to the very last one, our lowercase, our recessive ones, I'll use purple for this, three out of 283 have that lowercase genotype. Okay, so that's three out of 283 individuals. So the frequency is 0 0.011. Okay, now then keep in mind these numbers for the next slide because now we're going to go to step two. Okay, so I'm just going to take a second to rewrite on this slide what we just wrote in terms of the frequencies. So we had on the previous slide a, a frequency was 0 0.788 heterozygous was 0 0.201 and homozygous recessive was 0 0.011. So now our next step, step number two, is based on those genotype frequencies. So based on genotype frequencies that we just calculated, Okay, that we just calculated, what are the allele frequencies? Okay, so we now want to do first the frequency of our first allele, capital A. Well, again, in order to do that, you go to your genotype frequencies and you ask yourself, where do you see the letter A, right? So I'm going to do this the second option that I showed you where you're using the genotype frequencies themselves. So the frequency of capital A is this whole top number, this whole homozygous dominant frequency, plus where else do we see it? the second number, but it's only half of that, okay? Our dominant allele only represents half of that genotype frequency because the other half is the recessive allele. So we say plus one half of our heterozygous frequency, and that should give you 0 0.89 frequency of allele capital A, okay? So we circle star highlight that number, that's for capital A. And then we need to calculate the frequency of our second allele. 
which again is half of the heterozygous plus the whole homozygous recessive. Okay, and that should give you 0 0.11. Now, you also could have simply done, once you have the first number, which in this case was 0 0.89, you also could have just done 1 minus 0 0.89. Because like we mentioned earlier, you have to have the frequency of both of your alleles equal to 100. So you could have done it that way as well. Then the reason why we did, I, I didn't do it that way was because the point of this is to really see whether or not this frequency is in equilibrium. So since we weren't told it was in equilibrium yet, I didn't want to assume anything. So I did not want to do one minus, okay? So even though you technically might be tempted to do that, try to avoid it. Instead, calculate it the way we just did here, uh, where for that second one, we did one half plus the homozygous genotype. The very last thing to do, now we have the frequencies of the alleles. And again, I'm going to remind you what they are because it's not like the big chalkboard where you get to still see. The frequency of capital A we said was 0.89, and the frequency of lowercase a we calculated as 0.11. Now the last thing we're going to do is step three, which is based on those allele frequencies. Okay, based on those allele frequencies, what should Hardy-Weinberg genotype frequencies be? Okay, notice what we're saying. In step one, we calculated genotype frequencies, but they weren't Hardy-Weinberg frequencies. In step one, we calculated the observed genotype frequencies for that population, the genotype frequencies that we are seeing in the individuals of that population. Whereas Hardy-Weinberg, they want to talk about populations that are in equilibrium. So their, freq their, their calculations that they gave us are for equilibrium. So in this question, when I say based on those allele frequencies, uh, what should Hardy-Weinberg genotype frequencies be? What we're going to calculate now are expected genotype frequencies. So you can go back in your notes and where we had step one of this example, you can write, those are your observed genotype frequencies. Now we're going to calculate the expected based on Hardy-Weinberg. And if you remember, Hardy-Weinberg said P squared, 2PQ, and Q squared. Okay, so P squared, 2PQ, and Q squared as the three genotypes. So now P squared, What's p squared? That's our first allele squared, right? So that is 0 0.89 squared, which if you plug that into the calculator should give you 0.792 as the genotype for equilibrium of capital A, capital A. Then we have, I'll change the color of it to P, Q, and P, Q, remember, that is saying capital A and lowercase a. So now we're doing two. What's our capital A frequency? 0.89. What's our second allele's frequency? 0.11. And when you do two times allele, the first allele times the second allele's frequency, you get 0 0.196 as the genotype AA, okay?
And then our last one to calculate is Q squared. Q squared, which is just our second allele. So 0 0.11 squared, okay, which should give you 0 0.012. Genotype, double lowercase a. Now you can remind yourself underneath each of these in your notes so you remember where you got it. The first one is our first allele. In the second equation, it's two times first allele times second allele frequency. And then the third one is your second allele, okay? The reason why sometimes I write that out, and I'll even write up here, lowercase a, that is what we mean by second allele. The reason why I write that out sometimes is a lot of times students will jot down notes in class, and then they go back to read them, and they're like, wait, what's this 0.11 from? What's this 0.89? What am I doing? What, what, what was I even in that class? Okay, so writing things like that out for yourself helps you then remember later on why you did it, okay? Then our last step is to actually analyze what these results just told us. So how do we analyze what the final results tell us? What does it mean if there's a difference? Well, we just calculated expected frequencies. And whenever you have expected, when we did a previous lesson way back in the past, I'm not going to say what it was because that's what you're going to tell me in a minute uh, in the Remind app. But when we did a previous lesson, whenever you mentioned it expected something, you then compared it to observed of something, right? So what we're going to do is I'm going to rewrite what we calculated on some of the other slides. Remember in step one, so reminder of step one answers which we said were our observed genotypes. Sorry, my handwriting is very sloppy today. Observed genotypes, okay? We said we have our three genotypes. Capital A, lowercase a, that frequency was 0 0.788. Heterozygous was 0 0.201, and the recessive was 0 0.011. We then, in step three, had answers that were our expected Hardy-Weinberg genotypes. Okay, and we're going to go capital A again, heterozygous and homozygous recessive. And in our expected, we calculated 0 0.792, 0 0.196, and 0 0.012. So what those tell us here, the, these expected, these are the genotypes, frequencies, if a population is in equilibrium, if it's ideal, if it's in equilibrium, because that's what Hardy-Weinberg say. Hardy-Weinberg is for equilibrium. So what's the last step of all of this? How do we know if this population is in equilibrium? Well, we compare what we actually see in the population with what we would expect in equilibrium. So for instance, our population has 0.788 or 78.8% homozygous dominant. Okay, so I'm referring to the first one here. 
If it's in equilibrium, it should have 0 0.79.2 or 79.2% of the population as homozygous dominant. Well, those numbers are fairly close. Then we look at the second one, 0 0.2 versus 0 0.196, which when you round it is 0 0.2. So the expected and the observed there are fairly close. Observed, 0 0.01, what do you notice here? Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium observe, uh, expected is 0 0.012. So when you compare those two numbers, they're all very similar. Okay, so when we look at this, it looks like, looks like expected expected equilibrium values are very similar to the observed. So what would that tell you? That, that would tell you, okay, this population seems to be population seems to be in equilibrium. Now we did this by eyeballing it, which on a quiz, the final post labs, I would be fine. Uh, that's what I'll have you do is just eyeball it. If the numbers are close to each other, like 0.788 and 0.792, when you round them off, they're both 0.79. When you round off 0 0.201, 0 0.196, they're both 0.2, okay? When you round off 0 0.011 and 0 0.012, they're both 0 0.01, okay, 1%. So when all three of the genotype observed and expected are close to each other, that tells you the population is in equilibrium. If even one of them was not close to its expected, then what would we say if there's a difference in any one of those three genotypes, you would say the population is likely not in equilibrium, okay? So if even one of those numbers was not close to its expected, make sure to write that down. I don't have room on the, the screen anymore, but write that down. If even one of the genotypes is not close to its expected Hardy-Weinberg, you would say it is not in equilibrium. And usually what I do is I'll give you numbers that are very different so that you, you're not questioning, well, is it close, is it not? I'll give you very different. So for instance, if you're expecting 0.788, then I would give you for, for the, sorry, if you're expecting 0.792, then I would give you for the observed something like 0.4, which is very different from 0.79, okay, far away from it, so that you wouldn't have to question, well, is it considered close or not? 
Okay, I know you hate the math and calculation lesson so much, but we're almost over with it. The last point that I want to make is, like I said in the previous slide, if any of your expected frequencies are very different from the observed frequencies in that population, it basically tells you that population is not at true equilibrium and that one or more of the assumptions on this slide are basically being violated in that population. And these are the five assumptions that Hardy Weinberg makes about a, a population in equilibrium. The first one here is that individuals of all genotypes should have equal rates of survival and equal reproductive success. Basically what that means is if you look at the figure here, no selection would be going on in a population that's at equilibrium. So that means that, for instance, um, in the example that we showed earlier, one of those genotypes, you know, is very valuable, the one that makes you resistant to HIV. And so if there was selection going on and, you know, people only wanted to mate with people who had that very valuable genotype, then of course you're gonna see fluctuations in, in genotypes. Eventually you might even have some of the genotypes disappearing, having you know zero frequency in that population because the favorable ones would be so you know overpowering mathematically and, and you would end up with you know completely being out of equilibrium. The next assumption. No and new alleles are created or converted from one allele to another. What is that a fancy way of saying? If a population is at true Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, there should be no mutations, okay? No new alleles because that would completely throw off these calculations. We said that P plus Q equal one. There should only be two alleles. If there's now suddenly P, Q, and W, P, Q, and R, and S, that throws off our calculations. The third is that individuals should not migrate into or out of the population, okay? Because again, that would cause fluctuations in the genotype frequencies and the allele frequencies in that population, and it would not be at equilibrium anymore. The fourth assumption for Hardy-Weinberg model is that the population should be infinitely large, which you see here, okay, infinitely large because of the fact that in practical terms, you want the population to be large enough that sampling errors and other random effects are negligible, okay? So when we were calculating the frequencies of genotypes, for instance, or alleles, you only have a population of four, four individuals, and you were mistaken about one of them because, for instance, let's say you're looking at eye color. Well, in certain lights, you know, when the light is kind of dim, you can't really tell the difference between hazel eyes and green eyes or hazel eyes and blue eyes. So maybe you were wrong about one of the individuals. Well, if your calculations were out of, you know, a thousand people, being wrong about one or two of the people it's not going to change your numbers very much. But if there were only four people in your sample and you're wrong about one of them, well, now your numbers just change drastically. So the Hardy-Weinberg model wants there to be an infinitely large population. And the last assumption is that individuals in the population mate randomly, which I know the idea of random mating, which you see over here, sounds funny. But it's basically going back to the point that we made in the first assumption. You don't want selection going on. You don't want, you know, people to be picking only one particular genotype saying, hey, that's the best looking of the, the, the genotypes. I want to make with that one, you know, because that will then put everything out of equilibrium and it will skew the numbers and the calculations. Okay, so we're not going to get into much detail beyond that, but I just want you to be aware of what it tells you when your population is not in equilibrium. The fact that one or more of these assumptions is being broken in that population. Okay, so if I gave you uh, a problem to work out and it turns out that the, the observed and expected are very different from each other, you should be able to tell me, well, 
Maybe selection's going on. Maybe mutation's going on. Maybe migration is going on. Maybe it was too small of a population or maybe there was not random mating. Okay, because if the population, the observed and the expected are different, it tells you one or more of the assumptions on this page are being broken, okay, meaning that they're not happening, okay? Contact me with any questions you have. So now I know that was a whole lot of information today. I just want to see how comfortable you are with the Hardy-Weinberg analysis. So here it is remind app time. I want you to pause this slide. I want you to, on a sheet of paper, write out your answers to these questions. Show me your work. Show me your logic and thinking behind it. And then please send me a single picture so I have, you know, all in one place your answers to all of this and we'll go over we'll review it now i know it's easy for you to ask one of your friends for the you know answer to this that teaches you nothing because these remind app answers i'm not grading whether you get it right or not okay it's just a participation credit yay good for you you sent me the answer you're you're doing well it's for me to then give you feedback help teach you things that are causing you to struggle to help see if you're having a problem that you may not even realize you're having a problem understanding something. So these remind up answers when you are honest and give me your own answer rather than trying to copy from someone else, you now get the benefit of getting extra help from me and guaranteeing that you're more likely to get it correct on the exams. If you cheat now on the remind app answer, you then mess yourself up on the exam where your answer actually counts toward your grade. Okay, so please remember to always, you know, give me your own answer, even if it's incorrect, even if you just flat out tell me, Professor, I am so lost. Can you just help me? I can't even give you an answer right now because I am that lost, okay? And I will help you work through it so that when the time comes for the exam or even future classes when you encounter this, you'll be a pro, you'll be an expert, you'll have no worries. That is it for today. Again, I know it's a lot of information thrown your way. Please, as always, contact me with any questions or concerns and please, Check the syllabus and the weekly folder that you just got this video from to make sure that you are on track, you took care of everything for the week, and that you know what to expect for next time. Okay, thank you and have a great day.